Thank you so much for the kind introduction. And Kim, it's a pleasure to be here with you as a fellow writer uh, and a friend. And uh, I've always been a big admirer of your work and your um, analysis of American history, what America means, the, the promises of America, the failings of America. And both of us have tackled that in, in depth in our work. It's, it's a rewarding job. It's also very tough because sometimes we have to look at our own preconceptions of this country. And um, I'd like to just ask you, you know, what, what can you sort of summarize your, your, your book, uh, The Nation Never Was, in terms of how it addresses the promises and also the failings of America and our sort of a refounding, as you would say? Uh, gosh, well, first, let me thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for inviting me to do this with you, Steve. And I don't, I don't want to spend too much time talking about my book. It's a fascinating book. You should all read it. But we're really here for Steve. Um, but I will say just briefly, so the idea of this book is that we say that America is committed to a set of values, including, I think, universal liberty and equality and democracy. Um, and I think that's great. And I think that we as Americans in our better moments really are committed to those values. But then we say something else, which is that those values were handed down to us from the founding. And they were stated in the Declaration of Independence, and they were fought for in the Revolutionary War, and then they were sort of made into law with the original Constitution written in 1787. And what my study of the Constitution and history over the past you know, 20 years or so that I've been teaching at Penn, or the past 10 years maybe when I've been focusing really closely on these ideas, is we're making a fundamental mistake in attributing those ideas to the founding rather than Reconstruction, the period after the Civil War when we totally changed our constitutional order and really introduced values of universal liberty and equality and democracy. And the reason, there are complicated reasons, I think, that we tell this story is starting in the founding and not starting with Reconstruction. But the story that we tell ourselves, I think, has some harmful consequences. And so ultimately, my idea in the book is we could replace that. We could replace our story of American identity that focuses on the founding with one that focuses more on Reconstruction. And it would have various salutary consequences. So it is sort of about American ideals and where they come from and who lived up to them and who didn't, um, which is also something that Stephen is interested in. So maybe you could start by giving us a little bit of a summary of this book. And then I'm going to ask you an additional question, which is how did you come to this topic? Well, my book actually does, it starts in 1881 with the assassination of Tsar Alexander II of Russia. And uh, that was a turning point for the Jews of Russia. There were 4 million Jews in Russia at this time. And they were experiencing tremendous persecution you know, for decades, if not centuries. But in 1881 and in the, in the years moving forward, Russia was an anomaly in that Europe and the other European nations like Germany, Great Britain, France, uh, Austria-Hungary were moving towards, if not the same ideals that America was espousing after the Civil War, towards more uh, liberty, more uh, rights for um, all peoples within their populations. Jews were given citizenship, full citizenship, especially in Austria-Hungary and Germany. Russia, on the other hand, was turning away more towards autocracy uh, and uh, absolute rule. They, the successor to our Tsar Alexander II, Tsar Alexander III, his son, uh, reacted violently to his father's death, saying, see, this is what happens when Russia does what the Western European nations do, when they do this democracy thing, when they do things like free the serfs. This is what happens. You get assassination, you get disorder. So Tsar Alexander II clamped down, and he particularly aimed his ire at Russia's Jews, who he saw as the most nonconformist people who would not follow the traditional state doctrines of autocracy, uh, orthodoxy, and nationality. Those are the three terms that Alexander III used. And it, harking back to the Civil War, uh, Abraham Lincoln was very interesting when he said, when he talked about the hypocrisy of the nation living half free, half slave, he said, if I was to experience truth, I would move to a place where despotism could be taken pure, like Russia. So the Jews be in Russia became the target of pogroms of mass conscription in the military where they were stripped of their faith, they were stripped of their family. Boys as young as nine or 10 years old were being drafted into the Russian army. And Cossacks, uh, with the blessing of the Orthodox Church, were free to, along with 
ordinary Russians, ordinary peasants were given free reign to loot, burn, rape, and kill. Um, no one got punished. It was seen as the, the, the Russian government, the Tsar, Alexander III and his son, Nicholas II, saw this as well. This is kind of a, a safety valve. So if people ever feel like angry at something, well, just go take it out on the Jews. And four million Jews, that's a lot of people. Um, and they were all confined to the so-called Pale of Settlement in modern day Ukraine, Belarus, uh, par parts of the world that are very relevant today. And they were faced with a stark choice. Should we stay here and hopefully things will get better? Or do we drop everything we know, sell everything we own, leave everyone we've ever known, and try to get on a ship to America. And it was a very stark choice. And the America that they wanted to go to was the America of the post-Civil War, Reconstruction, uh, and greater universal human rights. And there was, there was limited, I mean, there was basically unlimited immigration um, allowed from around 1860 to 1921, 22. Um, and that was, and as well as lots of job opportunities and America's growing factories um, in, in, in towns, cities like Philadelphia, cities like New York City. So it was seen as like, well, we don't know where we're going, but anything is better than this. And then the second question is, how did you, how did you decide that this was going to be the topic for well, the book is, that you were going to write? Well, I mean, this is something that I had known about since I was a child. My mother's family is uh, Russian Jews from Belarus. My great-grandparents came here around 1890, and my great-grandfather, Isaac Schlefstein, came here with a proverbial 10 bucks in his pocket, uh, married someone, I think, from the same town um, in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And my grandmother was the youngest of eight children. She was born in 1916, and her parents were in their early 40s when she was born. And uh, she said that her parents were very nice, but not very, um, not emotionally available because they were older parents. But she said that they also did not talk about the old world. She would ask them, tell me about Russia. Tell me about the old world. And he, they just didn't want to talk about it. They're like, we're Americans now. My great grandfather ended up uh, doing pretty well as a uh, seller of butter and eggs. It sounds very prosaic, but that's how a lot of um, immigrant Jews in, Amer in, in New York, especially, made livings. That was one of their, that was a trade. And my grandmother remembered uh, on the 4th of July, her, grandfa her father would always fly the American flag, make a big display of it from their uh, townhouse in Crown Heights. And that was one of her earliest memories, was that her father said, this is, this is an important thing. But the past, the trauma of the past, of the Cossacks and the, and the privation in Russia was something that was not to be discussed. So it's something that I heard about as a child. And it was also the same grandmother who told me about the story of the Titanic. I was around six years old, and that captivated me, especially the story of Isidore and Ida Strauss, who appear in this book. They were owners of Macy's department store, Parish on the Titanic. They were German Jewish immigrants who were also success stories. And when they died in 1912, they were martyrs to the Jewish community in, Russia, in New York. Uh, and th their death in the Titanic, their refusal to part from each other, uh, brought together the German and the Russian Jewish communities, which in New York and in Philadelphia had interesting, an interesting relationship. The German Jews had gotten here earlier and were wealthier, uh, much more versed in European high culture. They gave generously to charities to help out their Russian uh, uh, co-religionists, but they also looked down on them. And the Russian Jews felt, who are these people who look down on us? But their death united uh, these communities. And the Titanic was owned by uh, one of the characters in this book, J.P. Morgan. We think of her as a, Brit as a British ship. Nope, she was totally owned by J.P. Morgan's International Mercantile Marine, which was a trust created by Morgan to dominate and monopolize the steamship trade and the immigrant trade. It was big money, big business. So this story sort of goes back to my own personal roots uh, and also to my first interest in history. Uh, and because I've always been interested in ships since the time my grandma told me that story. So it's a, it's a coming home book in a way. Well, I'm glad that you started talking about the characters because one of the great things about this book is it's got sweeping epic world historical events as the backdrop. But the reason that I say that Stephen's books are novelistic is because he's got such rich and vivid portrayals of the characters. Um, so could you say a little bit about the characters 
that are central to this story. Um, and, you know, are there heroes? Are there villains? Are there complicated, flawed people? Um, who are the actual people who are sort of driving the narrative? Well, the main character is a German Jewish shipping executive named Albert Ballen, who was born in Hamburg in 1857 to a poor family. Uh, he knew anti Semitism, German anti Semitism, from a very young age. And he lost his father when he was 17 years old. His father ran an immigrant ticket agency uh, that was failing had, ever since the Panic of 1873 that devastated both the European and American economies. And he was someone who was not seen as particularly promising as a student. He was the youngest of many, many children. But our Ballin had a knack for shipping and for people. And he took over this immigrant agency and he realized, you know what, the way to make money is to really focus on the steerage trade, on the immigrant trade. And his timing was perfect. He started a small company called the Car Line with another Hamburg businessman just when the tide of Russian Jews was starting to get out, was starting to flow out of Russia over the border uh, from Germany, looking for ways to get to the sea. Now, Russia did not have any really deep water ports where a transatlantic liner sailed from. Hamburg was one of the closest. And Albert Ballin said, you know what? We need to capitalize on this business. This is great business. By 1899, he is the managing director, basically the CEO of the Hamburg America Line, which was the largest shipping line in the world. And that company made its money by stuffing 2,000 people, immigrants, into the bottoms of these great ocean liners. That's where the money was made. If you think of these big, grand turn-of-the-century liners, you think of all oh, these beautiful, elegant cabins and staterooms and first class and and wonderful service. Well, Ballin was very good at that. Ballin pioneered the, the, uh, the, the first uh, pleasure cruises. He was the one that had the genius of coming up with a contract with the Ritz-Carlton Company to have an exclusive restaurant for his first-class passengers on his ships. He had that vision of modern travel as glamorous, but he also would say, if I did not have steerage, I would be out of business in a week. And he faced this problem because you had all these Jews, mostly Jews, trying to get over to Hamburg. And it was basically a legal border crossing. These were people trying to escape military conscription, trying to escape poverty, and Germany didn't want them. He basically made a deal with the German government to privatize the borders. He said, we will take these people. If they have a steamship ticket, they can pass through. We can put them on sealed trains from the Polish-Russian border. Uh, a German border to Hamburg and to, we could also, we'll work with uh, other steamship lines who are based out of Bremen and Antwerp. And, and the Antwerp line, by the way, was owned by Philadelphia and Clement Griscom, uh, who made a lot of money in the immigrant trade. That's why there are a lot of Jewish people in Philadelphia, was because of Clement Griscom and the Red Star Line. We will divvy up these passengers and we'll put them on ships. And he also said, we will make sure they are fed, that they are disease free, so we don't, they don't get rejected at Ellis Island. And uh, it became a business. Now, he was conflicted in that he was never converted to Christianity. He rose very, very high in the German business sphere. He married a, a non-Jew. He, he said, I refuse to convert um, out of the memory of my father. He raised his daughter Lutheran. But, and he had a friendship with the Kaiser because the Kaiser felt, well, he's bringing great glory to Germany with his magnificent ships that are getting bigger and bigger, including this one, the Imperator, which was launched in 1913 and was much bigger than the Titanic, much more luxurious. But this ship could also carry 3,000 people in third class. So just think of the numbers, 25 bucks a head. That's big money. But he was also, by the German Jewish community, he was called an exploiter of his own people uh, for... Uh, making money off of these mostly Jewish refugees. So he was really threading this needle. But he was remembered as a, by those who knew him as a brilliant, kind, thoughtful man, but he was also tough as nails. So he was walking a tightrope uh, between these multiple worlds. Of an, and he always felt, no, even though he became a millionaire many times over, he always had this feeling, as was said by family members, that he always felt he was seated across the table from anti-Semites, which was especially strong in pre-World War I Germany, especially whenever he was doing business in Berlin with the Prussian aristocracy. He always felt this unease, that he never felt truly at home. So he was, I think, he became the person who I really fell in love with as a character, someone who 
despite his, he was so successful, he probably brought over more immigrants to America than any other person, single person. Uh, but it was not something that was, and he was balancing this, this, he was doing this delicate dance between humanitarianism and business. Well, so that's kind of a timeless theme, I guess, right? The, the tension or the synergy sometimes between the profit motive and humanitarian concerns. Um, in what ways do you think this story is relevant to us now? I think that it's very relevant because we are today uh, experiencing a unprecedented, not since like the early 1900s, of uh, people trying to get to this country from all over the world, fleeing violence, fleeing uh, poverty. Uh, there are governments around in South America and other parts of the world that are not governed by <laughs> uh, our our. Our, our, our ideals, if not, our, our, if not in practice, and there are people who want a better life for themselves, for their children. And this is, what, this is the same as what was then and is now. The America is a country that has then and now lots of problems. It's not always fulfilled its promise, but there's still people who want to come here. I think between 1890 and 1914, 18 million people came to this country from Southern and Eastern Europe. That's the largest migration in history from one continent to another. And today, oh, there are over 100 million Americans who can trace their ancestry back to not just Jews, but Italians, uh, Poles, um, uh, Romanians. And uh, these were people back in, uh, starting in the 1890s, there was a group of people that felt, and it, it started off as an elite thing in academia and high society, but then by the 1910s spread to popular culture, saying these people are not, cannot be assimilated. They are, this was the beginning of eugenics. This was the beginning of uh, scientific racism. Uh, there was the, the, the head of MIT, Francis Amesa Walker, who was a member of the Immigration Restriction League. He was not part of one of these academic and social elites said, these are beaten men from beaten races who are unable to prove themselves in the struggle to, for survival, and here they are. Oh, no. So we are having the same dialogue now about who can be an American. Yeah, I think that's sort of always the central question, is who is one of we the people? Um, and it plays out over and over again. Um, so I want to get some questions from the audience, but just one more maybe before we go to that, which is what would you say surprised you the most? So it sounds like you, you knew a fair amount about this topic from your own personal history before you started actually writing the book. Um, was there anything that really surprised you that you learned? I mean, the, the, the thing that really surprised me was uh, when, when people were like, what does J.P. Morgan have to do with Jewish immigration? He's the uber Gentile. But the, the more you sort of look at it, you're like, this is a man who, um, he's been, he's, he's a tough character because he didn't leave a whole lot of written correspondence. Uh, Chernow and, and Gene Strauss have done marvelous jobs taking a crack at this guy uh, who sort of put up this big wall of wealth and imperiousness to sort of block out any attack. But he was someone who really felt like, you know what, I want to do what I did for railroads and for sugar and steel. There's this whole shipping business, this transatlantic shipping business that is so lucrative. You have all these different national players who are trying to control this immigrant business. Why can't I just take it, consolidate it into one thing, the immigration, uh, sorry, the uh, International Mercantile Marine, I'll create basically the equivalent of the Pennsylvania Railroad and I'll control everything. My ships will run around the clock um, on time and I will control it all. And uh, he did this in partnership with the Philadelphia, Philadelphia and Clement Griscom. And it was surprising to see someone like J.P. Morgan fail. This was one of his few failures. There are two reasons why he failed. One was Albert Ballin, because Albert Ballin outsmarted him and did not allow him to take over the Hamburg America line, which had the most lucrative immigrant trade. I mean, that was the most direct source of, of passenger traffic. And Ballin was able to fight J.P. Morgan off. Um, the other thing that surprised me, the other, the other reason was a gentleman by the name of Jacob Schiff, 
who was the German Jewish equivalent to uh, J.P. Morgan. He was the head of the banking firm Kuhn Loeb and Company, which was uh, started in the 1860s as a dry goods concern in Cincinnati, but then moved into investment banking in New York in the 1870s. JP, uh, Jacob Schiff was an immigrant from Frankfurt, uh, came over with $500 and a package of kosher meat sent by his father so he wouldn't have to eat pork on the way across. And Jacob Schiff, by the 1890s, became the wealthiest Jew in America and an immigrant success story himself. And he loved to spar with J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan would not give Jacob Schiff the time of day. But Jacob Schiff uh, fought him to a draw over several railroads. He became the banker to the Pennsylvania Railroad and to the Rockefellers. And he also heavily financed the Hamburg America line. And his, he was very authoritarian, very tough to deal with. But his, the thing that surprised me about him was he was not just a banker. He felt that we need to make America the promised land for the Jews. The idea of, of a Jewish state in Palestine was just so, it seemed crazy back then. He said, who needs that when we have the America of the post-Civil War? This is the promised land. Uh, we can, I want to bring as many Jews here as possible. And that was a big surprise. He was not someone, on one hand, he was someone who was extremely tough to deal with. He was... Uh, stereotypically very German with his family and with people around him, but he had this immense heart for wanting to save his people. He felt the Tsar was the great Satan of the Jewish people. He felt he had no problem with Germany at the time. Uh, that was a big surprise. Was if you think, oh, anti-Semitism Germany. Before World War I, I mean, there was anti-Semitism in Germany as in, all, in France too with the Dreyfus Affair, but Russia was seen. If there was going to be a Holocaust, they say, Jacob Schiff would say, it's happening now. It's happening in Russia. Like, and uh, that, was, that was surprising to learn. And when he died in 1920, uh, he had given away over half of his fortune. He was worth $50 million. So imagine giving away $50 million more in 19, from between 1890 and 1920. The service was held at Temple Emmanuel and in New York City. Uh, I think it was the former mayor of New York City said there's no need for a eulogy for Jacob Schiff. He doesn't need one. He is who he is. But outside the synagogue were hundreds and hundreds of poor Jews, Russian Jews, who were assembled outside of the synagogue. They trooped up from the Lower East Side on, and from Brownsville, Brooklyn, to pay their respects to this man who had helped them make America a home for them. Such a great story, that is. Um, do we have questions? Steve, you, you gave two, two dates, 1892. 1914. The, the assassination is 1881. So yeah. there's a there's a there's a decade there. And was immigration tailing off in 14, or was it killed by the First World War? A very good question, Jay. You asked like I gave two dates, 1890 and versus 1881. Actually, I I actually should have said 1881 uh, with the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. And yes, immigration did tail off drastically in 1914. Because with the there was the the British blockaded uh, Germany with mines, and Russia said we're not letting anyone else out. We're conscripting everyone, and basically all ocean liner traffic shut down. All ocean liners were either mothballed or they were turned into troop ships, hospital ships. There was no way to get across. So you had lots and lots of people who wanted to get out, Jews and non-Jews who were stuck uh, in Europe at the time, and. Albert Ballin, who worked very, very, very hard to stop a war between uh, England and Germany. He felt that Germany and England should compete as maritime rivals, but should never go to war. He was friends with Winston Churchill. He was friends with Sir Ernst Kassel, who was Edward VII's private banker, also a, a German Jew. He used his considerable uh, diplomatic and business clout to stop this war, but the uh, Prussian uh, aristocracy that made up a lot of the the foreign office or whatnot say we don't who, who are these people they, they don't they're very anti-semitic and they're just like tell this guy to go away we have our own plans to start a war and when the war broke out Albert Ballin cried and said my life works is over my shipping line is ruined and he he knew I mean the, the Hamburg America and most other shipping lines especially Hamburg America line went bankrupt by 1918 because there was no immigrant traffic. 
You had uh, the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee here in America, uh, headed by Jacob Schiff and by his son-in-law, uh, Felix Warburg, trying to send money or all sorts of aid to these uh, Russian Jews who were stuck uh, in the fighting in the Eastern Front between uh, Russia and Germany. Uh, thousands and thousands were, were, were killed or conscripted. It was, it, it was over. And then in 1920, in the early 20s, the American Congress passed these extremely restrictive immigration laws that effectively barred people from Southern and Eastern Europe from coming to this country. Yes. Do you touch on um, the contribution or from Baron de Hirsch? Are you familiar with him? Yes. Going to South America? Yes. Um, you, you asked uh, about the contributions of, of Baron de Hirsch. Yeah, Baron de Hirsch was a Belgian uh, uh, Jew, and a nobleman, who started something called the de Hirsch Fund, which was uh, one of many Jewish charities which Jacob Schiff was involved with. Uh, Jacob Schiff was pretty much had his uh, finger in every, in every pie regarding uh, Jewish philanthropy, but the Baron de Hirsch Fund was something that it was a fund that encouraged Jews to settle in South, in South America and in the United States to help give them assistance. And Jacob Schiff himself was involved with the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which gave out small loans to immigrant Jews uh, on the Lower East Side to start their own businesses. My wife's uh, great-grandfather uh, came over to this country on a Hamburg America line ship called the SS Pennsylvania in steerage, and he was a tanner uh, over in Poland. And he's operated a push cart uh, on the Lower East Side, like so many Jews, including probably my great-grandfather. And he got a $50 loan from the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society to expand his business, and he eventually became quite a wealthy man. And that's the story that uh, repeats all over the place. Like, there, it was sort of the equivalent of micro-investing. Yes, Fraser. Hey, Steve. Um, excited to read the book. Was there anything unique about the steerage experience for a Jew that would be different than from a Gentile? And could you walk us through, like, what a typical journey would look like in steerage or a third-class passenger, so to speak? Yeah, Fraser, that's a, that's a very good question. What was the journey like traveling in steerage? Well, the first thing you had to do was to get out of Russia. And that, um, that usually meant, you know, if you were in one of these small towns in the Pale of Settlement, there was no railroad station. So you had to get in a horse and cart, say goodbye to all of your family and friends. Hopefully, I mean, there's a good chance you'd never see them again. It was like a funeral. And you get on the, the, the wagon and hay. A wagon with hay, and then you'd end up at the train station, and then you'd take the train to the border, uh, the Polish-German border. And there you'd have to wait in a, basically a refugee camp uh, to go through these, uh, patrol these stations where you'd be checked for diseases. You'd be checked for all sorts of things that can get you rejected. Uh, the Hamburg America Line and its competitor, the North German Lloyd, ran these stations. Uh, and of course, you've had to sell. Most people had to sell everything they had to pay for the steamship ticket. At Twenty-five bucks a head. That doesn't sound like much today, but you're talking like a thousand, two thousand dollars. And for people who are very poor, that's that's a lot of money. So then you get on a train, and the train would take you through Berlin. Uh, these are sealed trains, so you couldn't get off. And then, it, in uh, just outside of Berlin, there was a a depot called Ruleben, where the immigrants would get off, they'd be checked for diseases again, uh, their baggage fumigated, then they get on, and they'd be put um, to, they'd be taken to Hamburg, and they would be situated in what was called the immigrant village, that was run by the Hamburg America Line, which could house thousands and thousands of steerage passengers for up to two weeks before sailing. Uh, and once again, they'd be checked for diseases. They would have the Jewish passengers or future passengers would have kosher food. There was a synagogue there that Albert Ballin built and a church. So you'd wait for your ship and then you'd get on um, a ferry boat that would take you up to Cookshaven at the mouth of the Elbe River where you'd be waiting for your steamship and you'd be loaded on. There'd be a brass band that Albert Ballin and Hamburg America would have to sort of, that would play as you're getting on the ship because he realized early on, you know, Good, you know, good reputation spreads. You might send word back home to your family and friends. Oh, take a Hamburg America line ship. They, they had, they had advertisements and ticket agents in and posters in Yiddish throughout the Russian Empire. You'd get on, and if you were in steerage on one of these big liners built before 1905, imagine you're traveling with your family. You are not in a cabin. 
you're in a dormitory, a vast dormitory, probably about the size of this room with 1,000, 2,000 other people. If you were a Jewish passenger traveling on a Hamburg America Line ship, you would be served kosher food. But imagine you have many of these people, most of these people had never seen a flush toilet before. They had never seen electric lights before. They'd never been to sea before. <laughs> this is terrifying. And then you're out on the North Atlantic on one of these big liners for a week, 10 days. Uh, you are totally segregated from first and second class passengers. The first and second class passengers might look down at the uh, lower decks at the open deck and throw food at you or whatnot. You were, there are signs advising do not feed the steerage passengers. <laughs> it, it was pretty, <laughs> it was, and, and it, was, it was terrifying, this voyage. I mean, the storms at sea, no matter how big the ship, would send the ship rolling back and forth. So imagine being there, especially with small children, and then you would get off um, in New York and first and second class passengers would be processed on board if you were immigrating. If you were steerage, you'd be taken to Ellis Island, then you'd go through the final checkpoint where only 2% of people were turned away. But the idea, the fear of being separated, of families being separated, sounds familiar. That is a primal fear for all of us. And if you're a Russian Jew, you think, I can't go back. What do I do? Do I leave the rest of my family in America? So that's that primal fear of people getting on Ellis Island. And just for reference, the movie Titanic, you saw third class. Looks pretty grim, right? That was considered first, third class deluxe because you had separate cabins for, uh, for families. Uh, you had actually people waiting on you at, at dinner. That was an improvement, actually, that Albert Ballin had introduced on some of his ships in 1905, 1906, and White Star Line said, let's take it up a level to attract steerage. So the people that were, if you were traveling third class on a ship like the Titanic, not the Titanic itself, didn't last one voyage, uh, that was considered deluxe. But for most people traveling third class, it was pretty grim. Yes? Ask the, 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 the significance of the title of the book. Well, for me, I mean, I was focusing on Hamburg because that's where most Jewish immigrants left from. It became the biggest port of departure. And when I say last ships, it was truly a race because Albert Ballin, as much as he was building up his business, as bigger and more luxurious and grander these ships were becoming, there was always this fear. What if America cuts off immigration? What if the political will in this country says, we're restricting? We can't have another cholera epidemic that happened in 1892. We are getting worried about these people that can't be assimilated, quote unquote. We need to have restrictions. And on the continental side, what if there's a war? What if there's a war? There are people, uh, I mean, our Ballin was someone who saw with foresight what war would do to immigration. And starting around 1905, uh, and the Kaiser Wilhelm II, friend of Albert Ballin, on one hand, he, on one side of his mouth, he talked peace, but when he was with his Prussian advisors, they were talking war. And if there was war, that meant no more immigration from Russia because the border would be cut off. And in 1914, the ships were crammed. People were just really, there was a sense that something was going to happen. And there were some very unfortunate immigrants or would-be immigrants in, in the summer of 1914, Jewish immigrants who were stuck in Hamburg when the war broke out, all voyages were canceled and they were put to work in labor camps by the German military. So there really was a sense of urgency. How long can this last? Yes, Max. Did anyone go east? I mean, was Australia or, or China or anything open for, uh, for immigration at all, for Jews or anybody else? Not really. I mean, that, that immigration to Australia mostly happened post-World War II. Um, America was pretty much the main destination. Some went to Canada, of course, but America had the most unrestricted immigration policy between the Civil War to 1922, 20. But there was no mechanism. There was no, there was no shipping line that could go east. I mean, the, the Hamburg America line did run a service to Shanghai and to Yokohama, uh, and the Canadian Pacific operated ships that operated between Liverpool and Southampton and, and Quebec and Montreal. So there was some immigration there. But the vast majority was to New York, and also secondarily, thanks to the Red Star Line and Clement Criscom, uh, Philadelphia, some to Boston. But New York, uh, Jacob Schiff tried actually, and he had this 
very odd idea uh, that might strike a, that actually seems distasteful today, but he said, if too many Jews are concentrated in New York and Philadelphia and the Northeast, then that'll increase anti-Semitism. So he says, we need to spread Jews throughout the entire country. He actually pioneered a, uh, he, he tried to start a, set, a settlement of Jews in Galveston, Texas. He partnered with Hamburg America Line's rival, the North German Lloyd, to start a service uh, from Bremen to Galveston, which uh, would, the, this, the experiment ultimately didn't work, didn't create enough of a, of a draw but um, I did speak to one classmate of mine from college who is a Jewish woman from Galveston, and she said, oh, my family's been here since 1906. We just ended up here because we got in a ship from Russia. And I spoke to um, the, the, a, a descendant of one of the characters in my book, um, uh, Jonathan Varborg of the Varborg banking family. He, um, his family, he was descended from Felix Varborg and was settled in America. His great-great-grandfather was son-in-law with Jacob Schiff. Uh, Jonathan was doing work as an architect, and he was in Galveston. And the Jewish congregation reached out to him and said, Jonathan Warburg, are you descended from Felix Warburg and Jacob Schiff? And he said, yes. And they were like, you, your family brought us here. <laughs> yes, sir. Did the characters in your book have any interaction with the Zionists? Yeah, uh, the, the question was, did the characters interact with um, early Zionists? And the answer is yes. Jacob Schiff was very resistant uh, to giving any money or attention to the Zionist idea. Once again, he felt, why do we need to do this when we have America? As he grew older, though, especially after this, this, by the time the First World War started, uh, he was very attached to Germany, and it was a very painful divorce for him to choose whether to be an, an American or to be or to sympathize with Germany. He realized he couldn't do it, so he, he, uh, and he also began to realize that Germany was committing absolute atrocities on its own. A lot of German Jews felt that cultural divorce, shall we say? Um, but eventually, by the, he died in 1920. But by 1918, 1919, he was nodding to the idea of maybe this, this Zionist project is a good idea considering what's going on in Europe, how Europe has now become, all of Europe has now become awful for Jews. And he sort of saw what was happening with possible immigration restriction. Uh, the Vorberg family, which helped finance the Hamburg America line, uh, they had some interactions with the, with the Zionists. Um, Felix Vorberg um, and his brother Max, who were financiers to the Hamburg America line, they uh, had interactions with um, Zionists. They thought they sort of wondered about whether or not it was a good idea. And uh, Max, Vor the banker Max Vorberg's daughter Lola Vorberg Hahn had an affair with Chaim Weitzman, <laughs> uh, a very torrid affair, a uh, very secret, a very passionate one. Chaim Weitzman uh, sort of won the Vorberg family over because Chaim Weitzman was a Ukrainian Jew who had spent most of his life in Germany. I think he got his PhD in chemistry and from the University of Berlin, I believe. And he seemed perfectly assimilated and perfectly successful. But he said that a lot of my, a lot of Jews in Germany were sort of asleep at the wheel and they did not see what he said. They saw the Russian anti-Semitism, the violence and the killing and all that. But he, he, Chaim Weizmann said, Another sort of anti-Semitism was taking root in Germany in the 1890s 19, through the 1910s, what he called a heavy, stolid, bookish anti-Semitism that proved to be more dangerous than anything the Tsar could have cooked up. So th there, was, there was tension. Uh, and I think that um, Jacob Schiff had this meeting with uh, President William Howard Taft where he basically urged them to stop do having any relationship with Russia. And Taft said, we are basically close friends with France, we're close friends with Britain, and we're close friends with Russia. Like, they're all, we're all, if should there be a war, we're all in the same alliance. And Jacob Schiff realized that because America was drifting culturally and militarily more towards Britain and by default France and Russia, he saw that, like, the window of, of opportunity of having a friendly relationship and having a friend in the White House was disappearing. And after a very bad meeting with Taft, um, one of his uh, Russian Jew, uh, one of his Jewish, uh, German Jewish friends said, Wir sind in Golas, we are in exile. And Jacob Schiff means, no, we are at war. We do not have a friend in the White House anymore. And he was, had a very close relationship with Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt appointed the first Jewish 
uh, cabinet member, Oscar Strauss of the Strauss family. But Schiff saw by the Taft administration where America was headed, and it was not being a foe of Russia. Yes, sir. Is there a registry of uh, passengers that run the ship so that one could trace, you know, which ship one uh, one's ancestors might have been on? Um, there are a couple of sites. There's, I mean, the Ellis, Ellis Island uh, obviously has a has a, a, a searchable database, and I'm trying to think. There's another database um, it has a Norwegian name. I forgot the exact name of it that, that 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 can help. But I think that the best place to look is the Ellis Island place because you can see the immigration records of when people came and went. And that would identify what ship they were on? That would identify the ship. Ancestry has ship manifold. Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Is there any discussion about immigration to South Africa? Um, I, that, that's a question I don't know about. I know there are a considerable number of Jews from uh, who moved to South Africa. I mean, the shipping line that ran between Liverpool and Southamp or Southampton and Cape Town was the Union Castle line. So, so if there are records of the Union Castle line, that would be a good place to, to search. Yes? Um, I researched actually those German control stations, the ones that did like the screening at the border. Mm -hmm. I'm very curious because the two German shipping companies seem to be in tandem. Like they're, they are technically part of the same cartel, but then you mentioned there's this inside competition. But did you find uh, Bala never, uh, did he have a lot to do with vegan to be run North German Lloyd? Um, was there like fear that North German Lloyd would try to encroach on this uh, population and take their customers from Hamburg? That, that's, uh, that's a very, very good question. Uh, and, and thank you for bringing up uh, vegan and uh, North German Lloyd. Uh, the question is, what, what was, uh, tell me more about the control stations, what was the role of North German Lloyd, and I think that the, the two shipping companies were rivals for a long time. The Bremen-based North German Lloyd actually was way ahead of Hamburg America for a long time. Ballin was the one that basically uh, got Hamburg America line to trounce North German Lloyd. And I think what, what the, the two men had a respect for each other. They were both not from the German upper class. He, uh, Wiegand was a, who was head of the North German Lloyd was a Gentile. Uh, the son of a gardener, so he knew what uh, being, you know, being a self-made man amidst that sort of snobbery at the time. But the two men, I think, united because they realized, even though they were fighting with each other, when it came to dealing to not being bought out by J.P. Morgan, they had to work together. Because if they did not work together, one or both of them would be taken over. And North German Lloyd um, carried a huge number of Jewish passengers as well. They operated uh, four magnificent four fuddle liners known as the four flyers that were beautiful and fast and luxurious, but they, they really packed them down below in the North German Lloyd ships. But yeah, they were competing. These two German shipping companies were competing, making lots of money doing it. But when it came to the Morgan threat, they realized they had to stick together. Any other uh, uh, thoughts or questions, uh, Kim? Or? Um, well, I just have one more question actually that occurred to me, which is how did you do the research? Uh, so where, where do you find all this information? Um, I would, when I first started writing this book, I got the contract in April 2019, and I thought the biggest challenge I would face was I did not speak German, Russian, or Yiddish. And I thought, this is a, this is a real challenge. How am I going to do this? And thank goodness I made a trip to Germany to do, record, do research in the Hamburg America line uh, records in August of 2019 with my wife and uh, son because if I did not do it then, COVID would have closed those records. And so basically uh, when I went to Germany in the summer of 2019, uh, my wife was a German major at Cornell, but she, her German's gotten very rusty. Plus she's now a physician. So she helped me some, uh, but I hired a translator to accompany me going through the archives. Uh, the Hamburg America line uh, archives were sealed, but thanks to um, uh, of my friend, Howard McMorris is here. He called up his friend Klaus Budelmann, who is head of, former head of the Berenberg Bank, which is a competitor of the Vorberg Bank. He picked up the phone and called up the, Hamburg, the, the, the current head of Hophog Lloyd, which is the successor company of the Hamburg America line, and called up the current Max Vorberg, who returned to Germany after escaping from the Holocaust and reclaimed the family bank, reclaimed the family house. 
and he said, and, and Klaus said, can you please let this person in and let them go through their records? So I spent a long time going through piles and piles of stuff I didn't really understand with a wonderful translator, <laughs> um, photographing like crazy, and then going to the Vorburg estate um, in the Blankenese section of Hamburg was an incredible experience. I remember taking the bus with uh, Peter Alexander, my translator, walking to the Vorburg compound, and there were these big gates with uh, security cameras, it looked very intimidating. And I remember pushing a button, the door swung open, and Peter was like, <laughs> we're in. And I walk in to the estate. The papers are in the bottom of the Vorburg house. Uh, and right off to the side of the Vorburg mansion is the children's playhouse that Albert Ballin gave as a gift to the son, to the children of Max Vorburg. Albert Ballin and Max Vorburg were very close. That was still there. There was a sundial overlooking the Elbe River where you could have seen the ships come and go. And um, I went through the archives there and photographed them and had them translated by both by Peter but also by um, some wonderful translators I had back in Philadelphia. And then the world ended or closed in March of 2020. Um, and it was, thank God I made that trip. But also I will say that I was very fortunate. I'm, it's amazing how much now is online. It's amazing how I was much I was able to do uh, from my uh, house in West Philadelphia, thanks to stuff being online. But that trip was a miracle. I still can't believe I, I did it at that time before the world truly changed. Well, thanks. Um, I think now you should sign some books. So everyone, you should come get your books signed. And also we should clap for you. Kim, thank you so much.